drives, and you know how long it takes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a long time. Shall we get here when the class is over? Oh. Oh, yep. Mm. <sighs> so that's what we are now at the Sea Snapper. Hmm? I'm laughing. So that's what we are now at, at Jewish No, 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 no. So. Not at all. <laughs> no, just an example. <laughs> Just an interesting example. <laughs> How are you, Lev? Very good. Thank good you. to see you. you. Good, good. Baruch Hashem. Okay. So, um, once again, a thank you to Rabbi Joshua Flug, who um, put together uh, the sources, and that I've borrowed his sources to give the share to you today. Good. People uh, ask, how do I come up with such interesting topics every week? And um, there are certain um, resources available to rabbis that some other very kind rabbis post <laughs> and it allows us to, um, to borrow from one another at different times and uh, makes life a little more manageable. Okay, so uh, we just had in the news actually, I think yesterday's news, maybe the day before, that there was a murder in 1972. I believe here in Orange County was the Orange County prosecutor. I think the biggest thing <laughs> that came to women last century was getting the right to vote in 1920. And this, you can tell who the father is by the genetic makeup. It's probably the second biggest thing that happened to women ever. Okay. You know, because like guys are guys, and for, you know what happened. Okay. So, <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Right, but he was a guy who committed murder. Uh, 40 plus years ago, and I'm sure was sitting very complacently that um, having been caught by now, I have nothing to worry about. But there was DNA that was collected at the scene. You know, probably didn't even know yeah. that they were collecting DNA at the time. But they were collecting <laughs> DNA and they still had that, and they're able to test that now. And then they were able to cross that with someone else. Um, who they were able to identify, and from that they, they were able to find the killer. Amazing. So, DNA is this, um, it's a real fingerprint, but it's not just a fingerprint of now, as we'll see later on, it's also being used in terms of, of um, let's say, po we had a class about this, post 9-11, post to identify remains or parts in order to allow the Jewish wife to get married, this comes up very. It comes up in many ways. Uh, so where, now it's become. Where is it? Where is part of the body? Is it in the blood or in the? Every cell. Every cell has a DNA. Every right? cell has its DNA. They're and they're all the same. Every cell has the same DNA, Professor. Am I correct? Every cell has the same DNA, but. There's something that triggers it to develop into a skin cell or a heart cell or a brain cell or a blood cell. But it's all the same DNA. So your DNA cell is different than my DNA. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Unbelievable. Like a snowflake, everything is in you. Yes, Unbelievable. yes. Unbelievable. Right? It, is a, it, it is, like <laughs> I said, like, like a fingerprint, but on the, on the incredibly detailed microscopic level. It's teaching yeah. us never to throw anything away. Okay. <laughs> That's why I well, that can be you. dangerous for some. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for some who live with some. So you have to be careful with that. Okay. So, with the technological advances in DNA, a person can now get a DNA kit from 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and can find out one's lineage. Now, um, I spoke to someone this morning and he said that he, he did this and it came out that he was 98.9% Ashkenazic Jewish lineage. I think like a 0 0.2, a combination of uh, Eskimo and who knows what. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, th there, th there's a lot of information that a person can find out. Now, ha how does this affect one's Jewish origin? Now, of course, the way it works is that a person receives, right, the, the, during the, the reproductive systems, 
produce the egg and the sperm each have a cell, if I remember my biology correctly, it's called a zygote, is that correct? The, zy the zygote yeah. is post-fertilization. Okay, so each one has a cell that only has 23 of the 46 pairs of chromosomes, and that way the child, when there is fertilization, then the child is a genetic combination of the mother and the father. You know, he has the mother's eyes, has the father's this, right? So, clearly the DNA is not going to help. Well, on first glance, we'll say the DNA will not help in terms of determining a person's Jew, uh, 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 being Jewish or not, since according to halacha, a person's being Jewish is based solely on the mother, and not on the father. So you could have all of the father's Jewish DNA and the mother not being Jewish, so clearly that will not help us in our determination of a person actually being Jewish. However, there is a test which uses the mtDNA, the mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed along the maternal line. So if A has mitochondrial DNA and B has the same mitochondrial DNA, then they have the same mother or the same lineage of mothers. So if one is Jewish, then the others will also, one can assume, right, that the other is also Jewish. So if many Jews share the same and the mtDNA, then there's a great likelihood that the other person is also Jewish. So can this be used to determine or to establish a person being Jewish? Okay. Now, according to our belief that everyone is a descendant of the same mother, namely Chava, Eve, right? So everyone should have the same exact mtDNA. Why don't? Why doesn't everyone have the same exact mtDNA? Well, what happens is there are mutations, right? Mutations are there are changes in the genetic code, right? And then those get passed down to that person's children, right? So there are mutations all along. However, however, um, there are certain signs on the mtDNA that have, um, that indicate, well, 70% of all Ashkenazi Jews descend from four different, they're called haplogroups, one of four MTA, mtDNA signatures. Right? Actually, they found very fascinating, they did a study, and the data showed that there was an early, what they call a bottleneck, right? A, a, approximately 100 generations ago, perhaps corresponding to the migrations of the Ashkenazim in the Near East, or, or to Europe, right? And this genetic bottleneck seemed to show that there was a certain concentration that everyone had, and then it spread out, right? We know that there are certain Ashkenazic, uh, certain diseases that Ashkenazic Jews are particularly susceptible to, right? And that, of course, will be linked to these particular um, genetic sequences that are found in a very high percentage by, by the Jews. So, it would seem, at first glance, that if someone has these haplotypes, these groups of the mitochondrial DNA, then that's a very good indication. And again, it's all matrilineal. It's only mother to mother to mother. Right, you speak to someone, they say, oh, Rabbi, my grandmother was Jewish. 
you say, oh, that's amazing. Uh, was that your mother's mother or your father's mother? Right? Because that's, that's, the, that's the $64 million question, as we put it. Right? That's what it all depends upon. But this mitochondrial DNA is only passed down mother to mother to mother. So therefore, it would seem that if someone has this, if someone has this genetic sequence in their empty DNA, one of these four, then it would seem that that is um, a clear indication that this person is Jewish. However, there are other factors that one needs to keep in mind, and that's uh, the Bayes theory that I, uh, I, I can't say I understand it well, but there are many different factors that need to be taken into account, and there's a, an excellent example that I saw this morning that I presented over here that we'll go through soon. So let's say there is this particular DNA sequence that 20%, right, or even 50%, of the, of, the Ashken, uh, of the Ashkenazic population has that. Very nice. However, that's also found in 0.2% of the world population. Non-Jewish world population. Now, 20 or 50% of the Jewish population is far less than 0.2% of the world population. And therefore what results is, a lot more people have this who are not Jewish than those that are Jewish. So are we looking within this group of Jews and say, well, within the group of Jews, a high percentage or a large percentage has it? Or do we look at the, at the population at large. And a lot more people do have it who are not Jewish than Jewish people who have it. Is it, so, is it Jewish today? Because they were Jewish before. These people, like a lot of Italians. The point two. They well, we don't know. They weren't Jewish we, actually. We don't know. We don't know. So we don't know. Some, it, it could, could be, be. Now, could be, it could be, yeah. but, but, but certainly a lot more people who don't know that they are Jewish or claim not to be Jewish or believe they're not Jewish have this than Jewish people who have it in terms of sheer numbers. So the base theory uh, is, is, really, is really ingenious and it's somewhat counterintuitive. But let's say a person tests for a disease and it comes out positive. And the test says, so I have it written down here, someone tested positive for a disease where the test is 99.9% .9 accurate. Right? And this person tested positive for the disease. So the person goes into a panic. Because it means 99.9% .9 chance is... Mm -mm. One second, Janet, let me talk. Is that you're right. <laughs> that, that's the point that I'm getting to. 99.9%, .9 the person mistakenly thinks that chances are that I have this, the chance that I have this disease are 99.9%. He might think there's a 99.9% .9 chance he has the disease. However, if you also factor in the data that 1 in 10,000 of the population have the disease, right? putting aside any tests, 1 in 10,000 people have this disease. So now, if we test all those 10,000 people, then out of the 9,999 9, people that don't have the disease, the test will give us an accuracy of 99.9%, meaning 9,989 will test negative, which is 99.9% .9 of the 9,999, and 10 will test positive. So therefore, out of the people who test positive, one actually has it, and ten do not have it. So what's the chance of this person having the disease? We've gone from 99.9% .9 down to one out of 11, which is nine, basically 9.9% 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, right, percent. 
right? So it's gone from 99.9 down to about 9%. Okay? So therefore, you have to take into account, let's say over here, you'll have to take into account the, those that have it that are Jewish, those that have it that are not Jewish, and those Jewish people who don't have it. Right? Again, you have to take into account not just the amount of Jews that do have it, but the amount of Jews that don't have it, and the amount of non-Jews that do have it, and then he's got, uh, Bayes has this very um, uh, mathematical formula to figure out the actual percentage. Okay, let's come back to where we are. What are the standards for proving Jewishness? Okay, and there's a very, very interesting Gemara, Gemara in Psachim um, 3b, Gimel Amad Bet, which tells the story as follows. I, I, in the Hebrew, I copied a large chunk because I wanted to get the Tosafot into it. But the Gemara, towards the middle, in the Hebrew, the English is correct, the last one on the, on the word in the Hebrew, those who are following Hebrew, is Hahu. Hahu Arama. There was a certain... A uh, Gentile. He, you know, some people like, uh, like Jewish food. You know, they like Chinese. No, I'm kidding. Right? They, liked, right? they like Jewish food. Right? So he loved the idea. Every Pesach time, he would travel up to Yerushalayim and get and partake in this incredible barbecue that we call the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Sacrifice. So there was a person, he used to go up and eat from the Korban Pesach every year in Yerushalayim. Amar, and he would, uh, you know, uh, mockingly say, it's written, he would brag, it's written, it says that a Gentile cannot eat, so an uncircumcised cannot eat. And I go there, and I get the choicest cuts, the choicest pieces of meat. Amalei Rabbi Yehudim Eviteira, Rabbi Yehudim Eviteira realized that he needed to, uh, to uh, curtail this practice. So he said to him, Mi kasafi lecha me'alia. You think you're getting the choicest pieces. Have they ever given you from the fat from the fattened tail? Amalelo. He said, No. I thought I was getting the best pieces. They haven't. Rabbi Huda said to him, Kisakut Lahasam, when you go there, Amalo, you tell them, Safi Le Me Ali, I'm telling you the tail's the best. When you go next time, tell them, I want a piece. I want I want to cut from the tail. Thank you, Rabbi. Thanks for the tip. Right? You know, only Jews know the really good Jewish food. Kisalik, when he went up to Yushalayim, Amr Lui said to them, Me'alya Safoli, right? I don't want to be shortchanged this year. I want to get from the tail. Amr Lui, they said to him, hmm, Alya I don't know if they said to him or they said amongst themselves, Alya Lugavoa Salka. No one gets to eat. From the tail. The tail is part that goes up onto the altar. That gets burnt as an offering up to Hashem, up to God. Amalei <laughs> said to him, Man Amalei who told you to ask for the tail? Amalei who? Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera. It was no, uh, it was no regular Joe over there. It was Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera who told me to. They, st- they thought to themselves, I mean, my hide to come on. What, what is going on here? Why would Rabbi Yudim Vitera tell him to ask us for the tail? It must be he wants us to investigate a little bit further over here. And this was a way that he could clandestinely do that. But Kubatre, they ended up looking into his background, Vashkechuhu de Arama'a. And they found that in fact he was an Arama. Okay? So, yeah. A, a non-Jewish, oh, a non-Jew. 
Now, it seems that, so if someone comes and says, hi, nice to meet you, I'm Jewish, we believe the person. It would seem we believe the person, right? This person was coming up there, professing, presenting himself as being Jewish. We have people who travel through, right? Many people come to our morning minion, and we'll count them as being Jews, count them towards our quorum, we'll give them an aliyah, right? They say they're Jewish, they're coming to Minyan, right? We don't start investigating, right? We accept them as Jews. Tosvot says, there's no English translation, but you'll follow along with me or just listen. Tosvot. The anachil and shufre shufre, and I eat from the best of the best. Mikan Tos says, from here ain raya, from here you can't bring a proof that, if any, that someone comes before us and says, I'm Jewish, that we believe him. The Shaniach is different over here. The rove Yisrael Hayu. Right? Because you have a, what's called a rove. The majority of those who come for the Pesach are Jewish. So it's not some guy who walked in off the street. Right? Similarly, someone, I would say someone who comes to our minion and starts putting on a talus and tefillin, right, the vast majority of those people, we assume, are Jewish. Right? So Tos says you can't bring a proof from here that someone says, I'm Jewish, we'll believe him. Because here it's different. Here we have what's called the rov, rov Yisrael hayu, vazlina basaruba. So one can argue and say you don't have a proof from here because here we're simply following the majority. But we can bring a proof from a different from, from a different Gemara. The Amar Leizil Gali on a Sid Bat Minach the Chaim Yehuda also came to Rav Yehuda. Vamenit Gayarti Beini Levein Atzmi. Someone came for Rav Yehuda and said, "Listen, my conversion was without a Beit Din, without a Jewish court. I converted by myself." On my own. On <coughs> he said to him, Listen, you are believed to disqualify yourself. You're telling us that about you? Okay. Right? But you're not able to disqualify your son. Right? In other words, we'll believe you in regard to you, but your son has an established um, status of being Jewish, you can't disqualify the behind the to Matzlim Yisrael any, right? That's because right, he could have said I'm Yisrael, right? And we have no reason to 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 doubt that. Right? So therefore, from there we see that a person says he's Jewish, if we have no reason to think otherwise. We accept that. We accept that as as fact, as the person's status. That okay. Now, the Ber Hatev, that's one of the commentators in the Shulchan Aruch, <coughs> says that there was a takana, something that was established in Lithuania, that if someone comes from a place and we don't know who they are, then they will need proof. They'll need some outside indication that they are Jewish. And he writes that there is a tradition from Rav Moshe Feinstein. The Iron Curtain had fallen, and Jews were streaming out of the former Soviet Union, it was still the Soviet Union under Gorbachev at that point, until it became the former Soviet Union, but still, while it was still the Soviet Union, Jews, the Iron Curtain, had opened, and Jews were able to come out. Right? Many of them, through the forced indoctrination of the Communist Party, had no, virtually no knowledge of their Judaism. So how does one establish 
that this person is Jewish. So, Rav Moshe, as the tradition had said, if they have two of the following three verifications, they are treated as Jewish. Number one, official government documentation saying that they are Jewish, right? The, right it would say Jew in the, in, in the passport. In the passport. Z- Z-H-I-D? How would they say? What would it, what would it say? What? It's in Russian? Yeah. Ivri. Yeah. Ivri. Yeah, equivalent of Ivri. Ivri. Nationality. Right. That's the famous fifth line. Okay, so under nationality, it would write Jewish. Two, Jewish names in the family. Right? Like a name like Sadovnik, for example. <laughs> right? So that's a Jewish name. Okay? C, knowledge of Jewish language and Jewish practices in the family. Right? We used to do this. We used to, uh, we used to uh, my mother used to light the candles. Right? You know, we wouldn't have bread for a certain amount of days. We'd have these strange crackers. Right? You know, keeping in mind that families, the older generation that was still observing, certainly for, for, for many years had to be very, very careful because one's own children right. could go to, is that correct? That one's own children could go to the authority? Yeah, in my time, you would lose your job or get expelled yeah. from the college. Yeah, yeah. So if Moshe had said two of these three indications, two of these three, either the, the, the passport, the Jewish name, or the knowledge of Jewish um, language or practices, right, was, that would be enough. Okay, so how does this work in our case over here, if we take this concept of rove. Okay. So, if a person is certain that they are Jewish, and they're asking the Beit Din to confirm it, utilizing this mitochondrial DNA, then there is some room for leniency. Or we're not, this is not the reason why I think I'm Jewish. I think I'm Jewish because of all these other factors. Right? My mother, I know my, my mother is Jewish. She told me she's Jewish and we have a long line, right? Right? So then that would be able to, to help. But once again, the whole rove idea that you have a majority is not very clear over here, like I said before. Because even if a majority of Jews have this genetic signature, but if you look at all the people in the world who have that same genetic signature, you'll have more more non-Jews or professed non-Jews who have it than Jews who do have it. It's, I'm sorry, but it's strange, because back in the old country, somehow they would go in with knew that you are a Jew. There was no question. I mean, nobody questioned I mean, school, high school. Anywhere I would go, everyone would know that I'm a Jew. From your name, Lev? No, just from my room. From a kippah? From a kippah. From a kippah. <laughs> <laughs> The tzitzis might have been the giveaway. I don't know. <laughs> From my look. It's, it's interesting. It's, uh, America is a different place. Yeah. But back there, I mean... It's interesting. Was, you, you, you hear many stories how in Poland, I would right, to any place you know, a person who would try to melt into the general society often was unable to because they had a certain um, Jewish look. Yeah. Right? Compared to I Russians, don't know if you is it, is, are the Russians more blonde, fairer complexion? It's hard to say. No, I mean they're. It's a mix. It's a mix. Yeah, you can have. Yeah. Dark hair Russians, but yeah, it's. Um, I mean. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so because they see the whole family, they don't just see. No, you. just see me. I was, Come to any place of people like me. Come to any place, everybody would know. 
kids, on the level of kids, it's not sophistication that I mean, grown-ups will, of course grown-ups will know, but kids I mean, in school. My, parents, to my family comes from So there was Russia. a different look. Yeah, my yeah. family yeah. comes from Russia, but when I went to high school, and people didn't know I was Jewish, per se. I went to an all-girls high school. And only when I have to say something, or I took a holiday off or something, nobody really knew. Yeah. 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 Yes. But keep in mind that if there is a certain, if there is a certain Jewish look, if there is a Jewish look, that's not going to help us because that is that is from the gene from all forty six, yeah. <clears throat> right? Right. Right. And that includes mm-hmm. mother and father, and and, and therefore, right. You know, plus, of course, we have all the conversions along yeah. the way, right? In and out, you know? So it, so it further, <laughs> it further um, clouds, clouds the issue. Rabbi, here's yes. my basic question for both Ancestry and 23andMe and everyone. Um, <clears throat> as far as any um, marker or flag, like Irish or... What are they using as their benchmark, benchmark or baseline collection of mitochondrial? I mean, how far, we don't have that historical mitochondrial DNA to know, or Irish DNA. So we, how are they knowing the So, the so again, there, there, have been many, there have been many studies done uh, identifying certain groups with Ashkenaz, certain uh, g- genetic sequences with Ashkenazic Jews, right? Exactly, you know. But you said like that's only fifty percent, maybe. What What are they using? I don't know. I don't know. So that really comes to the next issue. There's something called a siman. A siman is a sign, and this comes up in halacha in a number of different avenues. One, right, the the, the very first uh, section of Talmud that that children when they first start to learn the Talmud. The very first section that they begin with is a chapter called Elam Etziot, which deals with finding a lost object, right? And what, and what one must do. And it's not finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? It's finders have to become searchers. Right. Finders have to Look, do please. their best right. to help whoever lost it be able to come forward and identify it. There must be a siman. There must be some sort of identifying factor in order for that person to claim and prove ownership. And then, and, and until then, you must hold on to it until hopefully that person, that person will come along. A famous story where Moshe Feinstein was asked, why is it that we start with that. Why don't we start with the very first Mishnah, which talks about the time to say the Shema at night, the time to say Shema in the morning. So he explained why we don't want to start with that and why we do want to start with the lost object. So we don't want to start with that because, alas, many shuls start late. And therefore, the Shema is not said within the proper time. Here on a Shabbos morning, we start at 9 o'clock, we'll start the davening by saying the Shema to get it in within the proper time, because by the time we get to it in our, re- in our regular sequenced davening, it'll be past the time. But that's not what always happens. So he said, if we start with that, the message we're giving the children is, oh, this is what we learn, but this is what we do. Right? That we don't do what we learn which is the worst possible message to give children as they're starting to learn. And the reason why we want to start with a Mitziot is because how much is the kid actually going to learn that first year when they're first learning in Gemara? They'll learn a few lines here, a few lines there, but 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 let them hear over and over and over and over at that early formative point in their education. Let them hear over and over and over. These are the objects you're allowed to keep, if it's unidentifiable, and these are the objects that you must return. Right? So the child lo- learns, first and foremost, you lose something, it's got to be given back. So that's one classic case of simanim, of using um, a sign, an indication, right? some sort of a recognizable 
aspect it of also, it. It also starts the children off by looking at others rather than looking at themselves. Yes. Which Beautiful. is a very fine lesson Beautiful. for a child. Beautiful. Another place where simanim is used is, I mentioned before, after 9-11, when a person has died, a man has died, and he might be somewhat unrecognizable, but there is, you know, the person, you know, you know, you have, you know they're attacked by an animal, and, you know, who knows what happens, what's left of the body. So what identifiable signs will be considered a full positive identification to say that the wife can now remarry. I think uh, right? one lesson you told is dental. Yeah, there, there are many different factors, yeah, but that, that's where simanim comes in. Okay, so then, yeah, so we, we actually we could do it again. We had a whole oh, okay. lunch on learn just on just, just on that. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the Gemara discusses that, and that is the Gemara in Yevamot on the second side over here. The Gemara there says, Ein me'idim, el al partsuf panim. One can only, and here we have both in Hebrew and English, one can only positively identify, testify, that this person has died, and thereby again allowing the wife to marry, only if the testimony is with the partsuf panim, with the full face, im hachotam, along with the nose. Avobishi ishtimanim begufo, even though there might be some identifiable signs on the body, uve kelav, or on the garments or things the person is carrying. Furthermore, ein me'idin ela achetet seinav show. Right? You can't testify unless you actually saw the person died. Right? The Michigan say, you know, you see he's being attacked by a wild animal and you run for your life. You don't know. Right? On the news recently, a person was attacked by a mountain lion and he managed to uh, suffocate the lion and, um, and, and save himself. Right? So you can't testify until you actually saw the person die and you saw the full face. On that, the Gemara says, and we have it right underneath there, both in Hebrew and English. Even though there are signs, where this seems to indicate the simanin lav da'oraita, that simanin, these signs, will not, these identification marks, are not da'oraita, will not be able, to, do not carry weight in a Torah sense. Now, where would that be relevant? Or aminu? Matsu kashur bekis. Let's say we have a get that was sent by a husband. And then there's confusion. Which get is this? It was sent from Ruvain to Leah, but there might be lots of Ruvains and lots of Leahs. So, he, the, 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 the shliach, the, the messenger, lost it, and then found it, kashur bekis, uba'aniki, uba taba'at, tied to a bag, a purse, or a signet ring, ocean insubane kelav, or is found amongst his different uh, items, afilu l'zman maruba, even after a long period of time, kasher. We say, oh, that is a way of determining that, yes, this is the original get sent by that husband to this wife. So you see that it can be used on a Torah level. Amar Abayah Abayah says, Lo kashia. It's not a contradiction, it's two different opinions. Ha Rabbi Elizabeth Mavai, Ha Rabbanan. One is Rabbi Lazar, the other is the rabbis in general. As we learned in Tanya, Ein me'idin ala shuma. He said that we cannot um, testify based on a shuma type of a mole as an identifying mark of the person. Lazar me'idin. He says that one can testify. The Gemara's conclusion is that it's got to be, well, there are three levels of what a siman, of, of how clearly identifying this identifying mark is. And that's laid out in the next source in the Beit Shmuel. Again, there's no English on that, 
You'll have to bear with me and trust my translation. Simon Aruch, the goats, tall or short, those are what's called Simanim Gruin, very nondescript Simanim. The lowest level is Simanim, the Lomahani, and it will not help. I feel a bit of Kama Simanim, right? Even if you put together a bunch of those, right? Oh, he was bald, right? And he was short, and he was of a stocky build. Right? So you have, you know, you know, millions if not billions of people who are short, bald, and stocky built. Right? So that's clearly nothing. If a woman, if such, if such were the identifying marks that a person gave, that were used to declare her husband dead, and she married based on that ruling, it was a completely erone- erroneous ruling, Tate say and she cannot remain in that marriage that she's gone into. Simanim and Sa'im, Heim Simanim Muvakim. There is a middle level, which is called a clearer sign. The Talia said that will depend if you hold in general that Simanim are accepted on a Torah level, then they will help. Such Simanim will work. If it's only Rabbinic, then it will not help. We hold like Rava that Simanim are the Rabbanan, right? And therefore, those will be those will be acceptable. If a woman got married based on those, then she will not need to leave the marriage. But we would not necessarily tell her go ahead and get married. The third level is Simanim uvakim biyoter. Those things which are extremely uh, specific, particular. And those are Doraita, and that a woman will be allowed to get married with. So, how do we, right, what means of measurement do we use to say that this will be considered a Simon Muvak Bioter? So, there, the different Acharonim have different opinions, right? Some say, Right? If it's one in a thousand or one in two thousand who have that, so then that would be considered a Siman Muvak Bioter. How does this empty DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, how does that fit in to this category of Simanin? How clearly identifying is it? So there are those, there are different opinions, believe it or not. As always. As always. <laughs> there are different opinions. Right? Um, a Rav Usher Weiss says that this would not be considered a good siman. Why is that? If one were to see someone else, right, let's say, Right, that one in a thousand, one in two thousand. Right? If one were to see someone else with that, with that identifying mark, it will be surprising. Oh, really? Right? That, oh, you also have that? Right? It's one in, one in a thousand, one in two thousand. Right? So then that's something that is very, very unique. So that's, if I want to identify a specific person, is this body this person? Then I'm starting off, I need to find the identity of this person. And I've got this mark, which is so unusual that it's one in a thousand or one in thousands who have it. Then that could help me fill this gap of knowledge that I need to fill. But when it comes to the mtDNA, that's not a specific to this person. It's not even specific to Jews. It's at a much higher frequency amongst Jews. But it's not a clear, clear identifier. Now again, in the case of the lost object, 
Or in the case of this aguna, the aguna is the name we give to the woman who is in that, who is, who is in that tragic uh, uh, situation where we don't have clear, clear validation of her husband's death. So he might be alive somewhere. And therefore, she's a married woman and would not be allowed right, to get married. In both those cases, there's something that is, so to speak, lost, and we're trying to identify that. We're trying to clarify that. So the siman will concretize this likelihood that that is who it is. Right? Whereas over here, the empty DNA is not filling in missing information. That is the information. That is what we are going with. However, the last source that I have is from Rav David Lau, who is the, presently the chief rabbi of Israel, and he is the son of Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, who was an earlier chief rabbi of Israel. And he writes, Lefiza Nira that we can align and say, Shigav Mikrish Lufanenu, Nitan Lismoch Ala Umdina, right? We can 